All right, everybody. Hail, welcome to this week's episode of Midgard Musings. Uh, my name is Jesse, and as always, I am your host here on this channel each and every week. Uh, this channel is dedicated to uh, various subjects of Norse heathenry, uh, something that, that uh, I've been doing now for nearly a year. We're getting close to approaching the year anniversary of this channel. Every week I upload new content, and it's usually stuff that is related to Norse heathenry in some way, things that are subject matters that have come across my eyesight or my view, uh, things that I want to talk about at the time. Um, and then there's also some uh, series type uh, videos that are on the channel here as well. If you go down to the playlist section, you'll see a deity discussion series. You will see a series called Broggy's Corner, which is kind of like a storytelling thing that I do here every so often. Uh, there's a Hobomol discussion um, series as well. You can check all those videos out down in the playlist section. And if you haven't already, please become a subscriber. If Norse heathenry or Norse mythology, anything like that, it is something that you're interested in, wanting to you know hear more about, hear my perspective on things. Definitely, please become a subscriber. And if you like what you see, give the video a thumbs up, uh, share it around. And if you don't want to miss anything, make sure you pl please click the bell notification, so that way you're notified every time I upload new content. Uh, so today's video is going to be on the subject of runes and bind runes. Um, this is a subject that we could probably go into great detail over much more than just one video, but this is going to be sort of the kind of a, you know, an initial crash, crash course, um, sort of introductory thing to the runes. There's a lot of information out here um, that you can get uh, readily uh, accessible, which we'll be talking about in terms of knowing the runes, learning the runes specifically, uh, that sort of thing. But I kind of wanted to go into the subject of the runes and buying runes specifically. Um, so before we do that, as is customary on the channel, I will go ahead and light the candle. This is kind of an ambiance thing that we like to do here. And get some incense going. And we will get right into today's discussion. All right. Let that simmer there, let that burn for a little while. Get out. There you go. All right, cool. All right, guys. So, um, uh, for anybody that is maybe not too sure about what I'm talking about when I say runes, okay? Um, runes are used to write Germanic languages. It's it's a um, it's not a language in and of itself. Um, it's a writing system, right? Um, there are many different runes that exist based on the time period um, of when languages were spoken and what system, what writing system was used to write in that respective language. Um, but runes are essentially used to write uh, Germanic languages. So for instance, the Elder Futhark, which is the oldest known system of the runes that we have, um, to our knowledge anyway, uh, is used and to, to, or is used to write you know, proto-Germanic languages. Um, things that predate even Old Norse, you know, some of the older type stuff. Um, around, I think it was like 700 AD, um, the Elder Futhark rune alphabet, if you want to call it, the Elder Futhark set, which is a set of 24 symbols, 24 letters um, of that alphabet, if you want to call it that, um, was replaced uh, by the Younger Futhark which consists of, I believe it is 16 uh, letters, 16 runes. Um, and that is used to write Scandinavian languages. We're talking, you know, Old Norse, things like that. So if you're looking at, you know, writing in runes um, in a language that predates 700 AD Scandinavia, um, you would be looking to write in those, in the Elder Food Art, uh, th those runes specifically, but most of what everybody writes in now, or most of what, what you would be looking to write in an Old Norse and recreating uh, a sentence or, or anything like that, writing in runes, you'd be using the younger Futhark, not the elder Futhark. Um, we know that the elder Futhark exists um, at least, and, and, and this, is, this is, again, this is just the, the, the earliest known um, example of seeing the elder Futhark used in writing uh, is around 160 AD. Now I'm pretty sure that we could assert that there's that they go back way further than that. Um, but what we see, one of the first recorded 
pieces of evidence that we see where in the elder food art rooms were used uh, was in a um, actual hair comb. Uh, it's the, uh, the Vimos comb in Denmark. It's a, uh, like I said, it, it dates back to about 160 AD. And on that comb, um, in the elder food art room, runes, sorry, it says Horia. Um, and Horia can be translated in, in the language of the time, uh, either Old Norse or, or even Proto Norse or Proto Germanic, rather, uh, as, as meaning something like hair. You know, so it was literally an item that was marked in those runes to kind of mark that piece of equipment, that, that, that item as being to be used for your, for your hair. Um, and like I said, the, the runes are a writing system. They're not necessarily a language. So a lot of times what we see nowadays is we see folks that want to get tattoos or write things in runes um, and they are literally saying, you know, like, well, how would I say, how, how would I write, um, you know, strength and honor, just as an example, uh, in runes? Um, and that's kind of a generic question because you can't say, that runes are not a language, right? So it's not like, how would you say strength and honor in Spanish, or how would you say strength and honor in English, or German, or French, or Norwegian, whatever. So to say how would you write it in, or how would you say it in runes, uh, really kind of boils down to, well, what are you trying to, what, what language are you trying to use to say that particular phrase? You can't accurately use elder food art, younger food art even, um, to write in English, in modern English. It just, it, it doesn't work. Um, but a lot of people like to do it. They think the elder food art look cool. I guess it's the whole aesthetic thing about it, um, but you can't accurately do that. It doesn't make linguistic sense to write modern English using a writing system that predates that language, right? Um, so another thing about the runes that, especially for Norse heathens or heathens in general, um, is, is their magical uh, essence, their esoteric properties, things that are associated with the runes um, specifically for magical purposes. Um, the reason why we look to that, I think, is probably going to be best uh, attested to a couple stanzas in the Hovamal, which I'll be reading to you guys from um, off of the, uh, or from the Dr. Jackson Crawford translation of the Poetic Edda. If you are looking to get a good readable version of the Poetic Edda, this definitely is the, a translation that I would, would highly recommend. Um, so in stanza, in the Hobomol, all right, in stanza, uh, let's say 138 through about, you know, 140, uh, Odin is speaking about his sacrifice of himself to himself when he's hanging from the world tree Yggdrasil, okay? He hung there for nine days and nine nights to discover the runes. And what he says in the stand, in stanzas 138 through 140, I know that I hung on a wind-battered tree, nine long nights pierced by a spear, and given to Odin, myself to myself, on that tree whose roots grow in a place no one has ever seen. No one gave me food, no one gave me drink. At the end, I peered down, I took the runes, Screaming, I took them, and then I fell. I learned nine spells from the famous sons of Bolthorn, the father of Besla, and I won a drink of that precious mead poured from Othrarir. The story of how Odin won a drink uh, from Othrarir uh, and won the mead of poetry, or stole the mead of poetry, is another story that goes into greater detail. This is kind of a gleaning, or his recollection, of that whole thing. Um, but here is kind of where we see the, an example of, you know, the runes being discovered, um, and that Odin himself um, uses the runes or, 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 or learns the runes and discovers the runes after nine long agonizing days and nights uh, of hanging. Um, so when it comes to anything that the, you know, as, as heathens nowadays, not everybody is going to be so inclined to want to pursue a knowledge of the runes. 
Um, but for me personally, I, that is something that I've taken a very specific interest in. Um, and so I feel that that is something that as we approach gaining knowledge of the runes, that there is some sort of sacrifice that is needing to be given to fully gain that sort of knowledge, to f even fully uh, be worthy, if you will, to, to receive it. Because Odin himself didn't receive the runes, he didn't take up the runes before he sacrifices himself to himself on a bitter seal and makes that sacrifice. Um, he says in stanza 142 that you will find runes, uh, runic letters to read. Very great runes, very powerful runes, which Odin painted, and in which the holy gods made, and which Odin carved. You know, so the the magical part, or the magical elements of the runes, um, I feel, are something that are is, is earned. It's not something that you can just one day pick it up and, and be like, "This is it. This is this is everything there is to know about the magical parts of you know the runes." Um, it's something that has to be a sacrifice has to be made uh, in order to get it. Um, and so because of, you know, we, we don't have a whole lot of specifics in terms of how the runes were used, if at all, in our achievement times for magical purposes, because the whole thing of it is, is that it's that part of the runes, the, you know, what, what magical essences they may contain or, or possess is something that's a much more newer approach. It, 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 it happens or we see it um, and examples that, that, that date later than the medieval sources that we tend to draw from, right? Um, the earliest approach to them, you know, never really has a clear insight of them being used in, in a magical context, except for some of the standards or for some of the sagas that we can read. Um, for instance, um, one particular saga of Egil's saga, the uh, Eagle Skola Grimson, uh, that's that particular poem or that particular uh, saga is is kind of famous, um, where we see Egil using runes, um, and, and, and and admonishing that the use of the runes or the knowledge of carving runes uh, is is very important. Um, he says uh, something that is in old. Uh, it's, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to read it in old Norse so. Bear with me, it's a uh, skull of mother runarista nema roda velkuni, which would mean that you ought not to carve runes unless you do them well. Um, in in Egil Saga, he is kind of known for using the runes uh, um, in, in, in the capacity to, I think it was the, to detect poison. Um, it, it's a wonderful saga, I haven't read it in a while, but you. I would definitely recommend reading it to get the full context of it. Um, but his admonition in that saga is that you shouldn't be working with the runes, you shouldn't be carving runes, you shouldn't be doing anything with the runes um, if you don't know them well. So that would attest to the fact that their magical use, their magical properties that are used for specific reasons, for various reasons, uh, shouldn't be done by just anybody. It, it should be something that is done by, you know, the individual or individuals who have spent time and that know what they're doing when it comes to rune work. Um, so that may lead a question for a lot of people as to, well, where do I go? Where do I start? Who do I reach out to? What do I do? Um, some really good sources uh, for rune knowledge and, and rune magic, if you will, um, nowadays, uh, there are some leading authorities um, that have some great books out there. Um, I'm going to just name a few of them. Um, you've got uh, Stephen Paulington, uh, you've got Diane Paxton, and you've got Kurt Hoogstra. And if you, like I said, I, I will be glad to sort of steer you in a direction if you want to reach out to me via the YouTube channel, email, or Facebook. Um, you can reach out to me and I can give you some more insight, but if you Google any of those names, uh, Stephen Polington, Diane Paxton, and Kurt Hoogstrat, um, these are some really uh, very, very knowledgeable folks uh, when it comes to room work. Um, there are many more, I'm sure. Anybody that's watching this that wants to leave their comments down below about some 
folks who they've you know read some you know rune knowledge about um, that, that share it down below. Um, so we're, we've talked about runes, and now let's talk a little bit about bind runes because this is part of the subject matter of the of the video is runes and bind runes. All right. Uh, so a lot of people will will say you know they, they, they'll they'll grab a picture or they'll they'll see something of what appears to be runes combined together, saying what does this mean? Um, you know what what is the magical purposes of this? What what can you tell me about this? Um, and the best that I've been able to determine is that, you know, bind runes are essentially um, a combination of two or more runes to do one of two things. Um, in the earliest sense of the word, bind rune, they are a combination of runes that were there to create a sound or sounds in a word. Uh, rather than using like two separate runes to make that sound. So for instance, if you have the Isa or I rune um, and then the Ing or Ingvas rune um, and you want to make an Ing sound, at the uh, you would combine the two to com you know, make that particular sound. There's, there's examples of that existing in uh, the Elder Food Art rune sets. Um, so from a linguistic standpoint and from that angle, they are literally the combination of two runes, uh, maybe two or three runes, to s kind of blend the sound or the, or the word that you're trying to say rather than using them all separately, right? From again, now from a magical aspect, and this may not, this may be a bit more my own UPG, my own view on things. Uh, there may not be anything that is historically um, backed on this, so bear that in mind as I'm saying this, um, that uh, the, the, the combination of runes for magical purposes uh, can, you know, you, you have, you're, you're, you're trying to invoke a certain thing, you're trying to bring about a certain energy, you're, you're trying to focus in on something so that certain runes can be used to com and, and combined to kind of you uh, utilize the, the powers of those runes, the esoteric values of those runes. You'll see it in the Midgard using bind rune, as I call it, the logo that literally combines manas together. You know, um, it's in the logo, which you'll see at the end of the video, and it's down in the, the bottom of this video where you can click on to subscribe. It's the Midgard using bind rune, right? Um, other uh, parts of things uh, or other aspects of bind runes for, for the magical purposes is that you have something that you're trying to, like I said before, tap into uh, energy wise or energy, uh, you know, focus on the, the magical aspects of it. Um, the Heathens Helping Heathens movement, um, you will see the symbol that gets circulated around on the Facebook page and in certain images of the Heathens Helping Heathens bind rune, which combines Manas, Ewas, and uh, Gevo. Um, that is a bind room. It's meant to sort of bring about the energies of those specific runes, what they mean for that movement, for the heathens helping heathens movement. Um, so <clears throat> again, it's it's there's the whole linguistics part of things, uh, which is more historically backed. And then my own personal view is that when when bind runes are used um, to uh, bring about a certain result of something or, or wanting to work the the weird or, or work the, the 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 sacred area of things it's not so much that you're trying to manipulate you, you know you want to manipulate weird in a, in a way and so you combine the runes to bring about an extra sense of power and or an extra sense of urgency uh, that sort of thing I've worked um, and have created bind rooms myself for not just myself but for for others for specific reasons. Um, I have had people argue to me that bind rooms are not personal um, and that uh, it has nothing to do with that. But again, that like I said, I'm, I'm maybe leaning more towards a uh, a personal view of things, not so much a historical view. So if you're leaning more towards the historical parts of bind runes and you're probably not going to see my as you know my, my aspect or my view of things as being accurate which is fine like I guess I'm not I'm not claiming that what I'm saying right now has anything to do with historical value it's just that I feel that if you're going to make a bind rune for 
certain magical elements, certain magical purposes, then it's because that specific need is personal to you or to yours, and that's what makes it that much more powerful. Um, one of the other things that surrounds, you know, bind runes um, in a way are some of the seagulls or symbols. I'm talking about things like the Vegvisir or uh, Egesiomer. Uh, Helm of Awe, the, the, the runic compass, things that things of that nature, things that we've seen uh, appear in certain manuscripts that are, you know, after the medieval time period of, of the sources that we tend to glean from. Um, so they are more modern. They don't mis maybe necessarily have anything to do with the older arch heathen times. So a lot of the, you know, hardcore recons won't necessarily look at things like Agus the Elmers and Vague Viseers as being anything that is important or valuable to the historical reconstruction of this folkway. And again, that's personal preference at that point. That's fine if that's what you want to do or don't want to do. Um, but in closing, um, I, I, will, I will cite a stanza of the Hobomol and I'm going to read it to you both in, in Old Norse and in English. First in Old Norse, and then in English, and that will be my closing statement for this video. And that statement is, Ves du fe ristasko, ves du fe rodasko, ves du fe foasko, ves du fe fristasko, ves du fe bidiosko, Vestufe blota skull, Vestufe senda skull, Vestufe soa skull. And in the Dr. Jackson Crawford translation of the uh, poetic edda where the Hobomol is contained, that can be translated to saying, Do you know how to write them? Do you know how to read them? Do you know how to paint them? Do you know how to test them? Do you know how to ask them? Do you know how to bless them? Do you know how to send them? Do you know how to offer them? And that is a question, or those are questions that I don't think anybody can individually say that there is a universal answer to. If you're going to work with the runes in a magical or esoteric format, if these are going to be things that you use, for your own personal growth or for the growth of those around you and your community and your tribe and your kindred and your clan, what have you, you need to know how to read them, write them, bless them, send them, offer them, all these types of things. You need to know what you're doing. Um, and that part can be attested to some historical texts of, uh, in the sagas, like I said, within Ego Saga specifically, um, where it is implored that you should not do anything or you should not carve runes um, unless you do them well unless you know what you're doing because you could totally mess things up <laughs> you can do something that's you know you think you're doing one thing and you're doing something else because you don't know exactly what you're doing so anyways guys that is the uh, rune and bind rune video there may be more videos about the runes and bind runes that that come forth from this if you're interested in hearing more about the runes let me know down in the comments section um, I'm definitely an, up to hearing your, your insight and your, your views on that. Also, what I'm interested in hearing is if you work with the runes, what's your take on it? You know, how do you uh, view the, the working of the runes and the magical aspect, and how do you practice your own rune spell or rune castings or, or you know, that, that sort of thing? Uh, some of that may be personal and you don't want to share, but if you are willing to and you have some insight and you want to share it, definitely would look forward to to hearing your insight. Um, we're going to go ahead and close this video now, but before I do so, I do want to remind you all and call attention to the fact that this box is up for giveaway, um, and the winner for the giveaway is going to be announced next Monday, not tomorrow, but next Monday, March 4th, during the live stream here on the channel. Everybody that's watching on Facebook, just a kind of a reminder, uh, the box is... Um, Got the Midgard Musings bind rune on the top with all the Elder Food Art runes burned into the bottom. And um, to enter the giveaway, just as a reminder, um, you have to do three things. You have to subscribe to this channel. You have to have bell notifications turned on. You have to pick a number between one and a thousand. 
and then you have to email me. So that's really four things, four to five things. Uh, email me at midgardmusingstn at gmail.com. That email is down in the description of this video. Send me a screenshot proving that you have subscribed and have bell notifications turned on, along with your number that you selected between one and a thousand. And on March 4th, we will select.